This special how-to is brought to you by Gaia Games, makers of Ninjas Unleashed. All the links are in the description below. Check them out for some great gameplay. We thank you for listening to our sponsors as it helps us create great content just for you. Hello, what's up? Welcome back to Tabletop Nights. I'm Greg. I've got a rule book and a coffee and a gorgeous board game. What more could you ask for? Today we're taking a look at Dune War for Arrakis from Simon Games. Let's have a look at how this thing plays. To set up, place the board in the middle of the game area. It's a big map, so make sure everyone can reach the important parts. We'll first shuffle the siege tokens. This is the main way that the Harkonnen player will win the game, because these are worth supremacy points on the supremacy track. You'll see there are two one markers, four twos, and two threes. Uh, the Atreides player can look at these at any time during the game, but for now, we need to randomize them and place them on the board. It's important to know where they are, so make sure you have a look because it's key to the Atreides' defense to try and figure out what he needs to stop. Then in each of those same locations, you can place a Nabe leader, which is a basic leader, the Atreides and note that all leaders are a lighter shade of green than the regular units then also randomly place one starting deployment token in each of those same areas noting that the Atreides player can look at these at any time so they might want to do that as they're putting them out but make sure they nominate which area they're going to go into first for the Harkonnen, we'll place out the four basic Pion settlements, which have a strength of one. The same as the Atreides tokens we saw a bit earlier. These guys here will roll one extra defense die, but more about that later. Also make sure you add Carthag and Arakeen, which are two and three strength respectively. At the same time as the Atreides player setting up, the Harkonnen player can shuffle their starting tokens, and they'll place one of each type in their settlements again find the best way this works for you you could nominate going from one side to the other and just reveal two tokens and start placing the pieces in because that's what happens now we flip them and we replace them this is a good time to actually talk about the units both sides have three different types of units basic units with a round base elite units with a square base and special elite units Sadaka or Fadaken with the hexagonal base. These are units. Leaders are not units. We also have the basic leaders. And then we have named leaders. Such as Leto and the Baron. They can all form part of a legion. But again, only units roll dice. But more about that later. The Harkonnen play will now replace these tokens with the relevant units. So here it will be two regular and one elite. These tokens are now removed from the game. Do that in each other spot and then you're almost ready to go. From the tokens perspective, these are all the different unit types. So again, the round is a simple basic unit. The square is an elite unit. The hexagonal is a special elite unit, and the circle with the star in the middle is a basic leader. So these will go in Hagar Basin. Again, continue until all units are placed. The designers have created multiple sculpts for some of the units, but they behave exactly the same. We'll now set up the ecological stations, which are represented by these six tokens here. The hidden side contains various markers that allow the Atreides player to move up the prescience track. So this is another way that you can earn points besides prescience cards, which we'll see later. Again, these are flipped over and shuffled and placed in their relevant spots on the board. You'll see this symbol here. Finding those spots is a puzzle in itself sometimes. And again, if you're using the miniatures, you can cover them up like so. No one can look at those markers at any time. We now place three prescience markers 
on the pressings track over here. Again, you'll see the same symbols we just saw on the ecological stations. They all go on the zero. And the Harkonnen player places the supremacy marker on the zero on their supremacy track over here. The Atreides player will shuffle the worm sign tokens, seen with this back here. But let's take a quick look at what they do first. The Arrakis map is made up of five different area types. You have desert, which is basically all the sandy areas, not to be confused with the minor erg areas in here, which is semi-protected by the plateau and the mountains. We have the mountain range, which are quite obvious, and include the North Pole. The plateaus are these sort of orangey areas here, including this protected area within the mountains here. They're treated slightly differently to these outer ones, but we'll talk about that more later. Note that on the map, areas like this that have multiple types that appear to be in there, you always consider the majority area to be the one that actually resides there. So this plateau piece here is actually just for decorative purposes. It would end at this line here. When talking about the desert, there are two types. There is regular desert and deep desert. So all sand areas are considered to be desert, but anything that abuts the edge of the board is deep desert. And that's treated differently for point scoring, for harvesters, and some card play. It also relates back to our worm sign tokens. Throughout the game, these tokens will be placed on the board and then flipped face up. When they're flipped face up, you'll see a few different types. Whenever you see these tokens, they're just discarded because nothing's happened. No worms were actually spotted. If you see this token, a worm will appear. Boom, just like that. If you see this burrowing worm token, the worm will only appear if it's deep desert. So yes here, no, it won't appear there. Keep that in mind and the rest is fairly self-explanatory. So for now, we'll flip these face down Give them a shuffle and the Atreides player simply keeps them aside for when they need to use them. Both factions have an action dice dashboard. The Harkonnen player also has a spice must flow board. We'll talk about that more in a second. Each player will have their dashboard facing themselves and they'll set their starting named leaders that are in play at the start of the game on this area down here. I'll just do this for the Atreides player so it's obvious how it works. It should be noted that we've removed the possible futures cards from these decks so they won't appear in this demonstration. Take any leaders that say in play at the start of the game and place them actively on the dashboard. Whenever you see this colored side face up, a character is considered to be inactive. The monochrome side, or with the larger picture at the base, shows that the card is active. Each card needs to be placed in its appropriate spot. You'll see Paul, Atreides, is a leadership. Stilgar is strategy. And Lady Jessica is Mentat. The boards also have pre-printed abilities that are always available at the start of the game and throughout the game. When I cover this with Paul, you'll see the original ones, which is move two different legions or make a surprise attack. They still exist on this card. In the center in a different color, green for the Atreides and red for the Harkonnen, Paul has his own special ability. We'll show how these work a bit more later on, but for now, that's the setup. You may even want to place the miniatures nearby or on the card to remind you that these people are yet to be deployed. Note that their special ability can still be used even if they aren't deployed, as long as they aren't in the regeneration tank. Again, we'll come to that more shortly. Each player will also have some cards that are already still in play, but they're not leaders that have special actions over here. So keep them nearby so you know how they work. Other cards will come into play when certain prerequisites are fulfilled. For example, this one, when a smuggler's planning card is played, Gurney Halleck will come in. Alia will come in when the prescience marker over here reaches space number six. There's handy uh, emblems on these tracks to remind you that something is happening. 
Paul Muadib and Reverend Mother Jessica will replace these characters at some point in the game. So they can just be kept aside again until they're needed. There's also the Wild Maker card, which should be pointed out, does not have die rolls, but is part of the desert power action. So when that's used, it will upgrade this section over here. Note that the Wild Maker comes into the game through the playing of the Shai Halud card. The Wild Maker leader card is then placed near the board, face down in an inactive state. It will come into the game after the cards are refreshed for the next round meaning it's treated just like a leader, because this is a leader card, and its ability is only used once per round. Again, being made inactive after each use. The Harkonnen player's Spice Must Flow board, which is placed here, or anywhere that suits you, will have three Imperium markers placed at this top section here. It's important for the Harkonnen player to keep these markers as high as possible, or well, strategically, they could allow them to drop to gain more vehicles. We'll come to this as soon as we get into the next section of the game. But these markers are impacted by these three cards at the top here, which introduce bands that will affect what the Harkonnen player can do. There are four separate planning card decks, two for the Atreides, two for the Harkonnen. These are considered the house cards. These two are ally cards. They both have slightly different purposes. Um, but we'll let you discover what they do as you play the game. It is a good idea to have a flick through them before your first playthrough, though, so that you understand how they can impact many different parts of the game. These cards are shuffled and kept next to the appropriate player. We also have the Prescience deck, which contains various objectives that the Atreides player will try and achieve each round. Again, we'll look at these more closely shortly, but it's very important to understand how these operate if the Atreides player is going to win the game. You'll shuffle these in preparation for round one. The last deck of the Atreides objective are cards. They'll be shuffled and one randomly chosen that only the Atreides player looks at. It will have the conditions they need to achieve on the prescience track. In this case, five green, 10 yellow, three red. Don't let the Harkonnen player see this. But based on the prescience cards you select during the game, they'll probably see which ones you're trying to get higher on the track. The players will keep their faction figures, sets of action dice, combat dice, and additional tokens and reference cards uh, within reach. The Atreides player will start with one Benny Gesserit token. Benny Gesserit tokens, when received, don't go straight on the board. They have to be added during the action dice part of the game. But again, we'll see that very shortly. At the start of the round, each player will draw one card from each planning deck, which only they can see. Now three Prescience cards are drawn from the deck and available to see for both players. Again, I'm only using the board here because I don't have enough cameras. These are round objectives that the Atreides player can try and achieve to move their markers further up the Prescience track. For example, reveal a Siege in the same area as Paul. So to do that, we'll need to deploy Paul at some point and then as part of their turn, they can just reveal that siege. Then, at the end of the round, if this card is still here, they'll get those points. Again, more of that will come up a bit later. Now we come to vehicle placement. Based on the Harkonnen board and where their Imperium markers are, they'll place vehicles out onto the board. In this case, three Harvesters, two Ornithopters, and one carry -all. If, for example, these markers were in this configuration, you'd just look at the the lowest one, and they would place these vehicles out. So five harvesters, three ornithopters, and one carry -all. Again, we'll talk more about the Imperium bands in a little bit. So for now, the Harkonnen player wants to put out three harvesters, two ornithopters, and one carry -all. So where will they put them? Well, that is surprisingly a very strategic choice. This is another good time to have a look at the structure of the board. The board is divided up into eight sectors which are determined with this dotted line, which moves around the board. The North Pole is considered to be adjacent to these four sectors, and movement between them can be slow and cumbersome unless you use sand riding or troop transport. That'll be in a bit more detail shortly. Let's say the Harkonnen player 
places that harvester there. That's very risky strategically because all an Atreides player needs to do is walk into here and this will be taken off the board. It's not an attack, it's just a movement which removes a harvester. So you probably want to put them a little bit away from the enemy. At least two steps. So let's say here. That's one. We may put another one in here because it's safe away from the enemy. And then we may put a third one similarly over here. During the spice harvesting phase, this harvester in deep desert will bring in two spice. Anything not in deep desert will bring in one spice only. But there is a higher risk of a sandworm coming when we talk about the burrowing worm tokens that only appear with a worm in the deep desert. So that's another great strategic choice for you. Now they want to place out their ornithopters. Where would they put them? Ornithopters are used for movement. So initially, this might be a good spot here. Again, we'll come to movement shortly, but let's think about what our objectives are going to be. We can also use ornithopters for scouting, and I'll show you that shortly. So let's put another one right over here. Carrioles are used to rescue harvesters when sandworms appear. Not when attacked by a sandworm, but only when sandworms appear. So we've got two harvesters here, and we've got one over here. This one will potentially give us the most points, but it's the most at risk because we're unlikely to be able to get over there and protect it before one of these guys walks in there. So for now, we'll put it over here so I can rescue one of these two. Spice is really important for the Harkonnen's endgame strategy, so you can't afford to just ignore spice collection. Okay, so all our vehicles are out on the board, and now we're going to get down to the uh, action dice resolution phase. Here, both players will roll all of their dice. This video is sponsored by Gaia Games. Enter the world of Ninjas Unleashed, Legend of the Celestial Stones. In this thrilling deck building game, you are transported to a parallel feudal Japan where power lies hidden in celestial stones. Extremely competitive, ruthless and fun. Build your deck and take out the other Shogun houses. With a mix of strategy and intrigue, build your squad, send your ninjas on missions and outsmart rivals. Multiple paths to victory await as you strive for supremacy. Launching soon on Kickstarter. Head over to ninjasunleashed.com now to claim your destiny. The shadows await. In round one, the Harkonnen player has a big stack. Two, four, six, eight dice. The Atreides player only has four. But they have desert power actions that are powerful and set them up for fast movement and attacks that the Harkonnen aren't expecting. Note that the Spice Flow board also determines how many dice the Harkonnen player gets to roll. While all the markers are at the top here, everything's fine. There's no space here to reserve a die. But if one of these moves down, let's say to here, let's say even this one goes down to here. The lowest marker determines the active row. Each round, the Harkonnen player must place an action die on each empty slot of the first column of the Spice Must Flow board on the active row and the rows above it. These dice won't be used this round. So make sure that you are monitoring this board. All right, let's do our dice rolling. Let's roll the Harkonnen first. And basically we'll be placing these on the matching symbol. Not a bad roll, because it's quite mixed. There we go. Again, they feel very stymied and uh, constricted early on in the game. They can now assign one, and only ever one, Benny Gesserit token to the board at, the, at this time. This is basically treated as a wild die. Whenever you're placing a wild die or excessive dice, you have to place it in an area that is the most free. So in this case, these two areas are free. Similarly, if we'd rolled three of the sort of the leadership symbol there, there's no room. I've only got two spaces here. So this has to be placed in the least crowded area. 
if there are multiples of that, I can choose. So let's put that one here because that can act as any die. The same happens with the Benny Gesserit token. I can't now place this here. I have to place it in one of these two. I want to do some deployment, so I'm going to put it there. Let's take a closer look at the Atreides board for a moment. The Atreides board has one extra special ability, which is this desert power action. This can be taken by the Atreides player when they have fewer unused action dice than the Harkonnen player. Remember that this Bene Gesserit token is considered a die for all purposes. So currently they've got five against eight. So we can take a desert power action. So different to the uh, rule book, I'm going to do a desert power action first because strategically that's quite often what the Atreides player will do. They'll always go first, by the way. I'm going to place two worm sign tokens. They can be placed in any area that doesn't already contain a worm sign token, a sandworm, or a siege. And they're used to disrupt the Harkonnen or move quickly around the board. So let's take a look at this area. I want to be able to get rid of this harvester because it's worth two spice points at the end of the round. So I'm going to place a worm sign token right here. I'll explain how they work in just a moment. I'm also going to put another one here for the same reason. It might be able to take out a harvester, but can also prevent these guys from moving out because they might be worried about triggering that worm sign. Again, we'll come to that shortly. All right, let's go to the Harkonnen player. They want to mobilize quickly. So there's two ways of doing that. There's with a leadership die, or a strategy die. The leadership die means they can move two legions with, with a leader. So if it doesn't have a leader, you can't use that die to move that particular legion. Or they can make a surprise attack with a legion that has a leader. Right now, we're not close enough to do that. Strategy allows them to move two different legions or attack with a legion. Deployment means they can deploy three regular units and one leader, which is a basic leader or a named leader. Draw two planning cards, and again, they can come from either deck. Or replace two regular units with elite units or deploy more vehicles on the board. These are all very straightforward actions, and you should have no trouble working those out by yourself. Note that there are three ways that named leaders' special abilities become inactive. One, if they're in the regeneration tank. In this case, we should remove Stilgar from the board to remind us his card maintaining the current orientation. Two, if we've already used the figure during this round and its special ability, remove it from the board and flip it face down. Also, if a figure is removed from the game, you would take their card out of play altogether. Note that all these cards are refreshed at the end of the round, regardless of where the leader is. Players can also expend one action die each turn to play a planning card. Simply move the die to the used action dice space and play the card and apply its effects. Most of those are very self-explanatory, so we won't go into that in detail. Remember, cards can also be discarded during battle to roll more combat dice. It should also be noted on the board that there are three impassable borders. They're marked here, here, and along this sector line here. We're going to do some quick mobilization using a uh, leader die. So we take this die, place it in an unused section up here, and that means I'm going to move two different legions with a leader. So the leaders for the Harkonnen are these guys, plus any named leaders. They're in a lighter shade of red, not the very dark red. I want to start moving these guys over to here, but it's going to take me one step at a time. However, if I use an ornithopter, which is connected to the area of my legion where it starts, I can actually move two spaces. So by discarding this ornithopter off the board, I can move this legion one, two, even over that impassable border because the flight has dropped me off over there. So I'm already on my way to seeing what these guys are up to. The Trades player wants to get a named leader on the board, maybe to help out in this fight here. One thing I didn't show at the start of the game was this little bag here, which has a number of regular deployment tokens for the Atreides player. It has this green bordered back. They go into this little bag and are used during deployment. So what I want to do is protect this siege that these guys look like they're coming for into here. How do I do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons why I would do it, but I want to get Paul into the game. He's here. 
So I'm going to deploy him into there using that Benny Jesuit token as any action die, but in this case, I'd already allocated it to deployment. And we get him onto the board. Then we draw from the bag one deployment token, which I can look at and place in that area. So there he is. Note that these tokens only count as one unit in terms of a stacking limit. And we haven't really talked about stacking yet, but basically you can never have more than six units in an area at one time. If I was to flip these and there was more than six, and there isn't, um, but if there was, you would have to remove any excess at that time. So you may be wondering why I put Paul in here when perhaps Stilgar would have done better, but I'm thinking about prescience as well. So as I deploy Paul, I can look at this card now. This is one of the prescience cards we drew at the start of the game. It says, reveal a siege in the same area as Paul. Wisely or unwisely, I can now, if I want, at any time during the game, basically, you can reveal deployment tokens and or sieges. So I'm going to reveal this siege. It happens to be a two, which is quite attractive to the Harkonnen player. I don't have to reveal these deployment tokens until an attack happens or I choose to reveal them. So if at the end of the round this card is still there, I'll be able to claim these points and move up on the prescience track. These cards can be removed by Harkonnen planning cards, so be wary of that. They may be waiting just for you to do it. It should be noted that I could have got Paul into this area in another way using this card, because his special ability says to place Paul in any legion then move two different legions with the leader. So let's go back to the board and replay that in a different way. Instead of using this deployment die, which is what that is, let's say I used Paul's special ability. Even though he's not on the board, I can still use it. So we're going to use a leadership die. Then, using your special ability, place Paul in any legion, then move two different legions with the leader. So I'm going to place him back in here, which is the same. I can still choose to reveal the siege to fulfill the prescience card. But now I can also move two different legions with the leader. So let's move this legion into where the harvester was. It's now removed from the board. I can also move this legion in as well. Let's take another quick look at leaders. There are several ways they can move around, through the play of planning cards, or special effects such as deploy and place. Deploy is to take a leader from the supply and put it on the board. Place can mean the same, or to move the leader from one space to another on the board already. Neither of these can come from the regeneration tank. So Lady Jessica here may be placed somewhere else on the board, depending on what the card text says. Note that leaders can never exist by themselves. If they're ever without units, they are removed from the board. So be careful. Let's look at movement and the stacking limit in more detail here. The Atreides player has used a strategy die to move two different legions. We have five units here and two units here. If this legion was to move to here, using worm sign for transport, they're never considered to be here. The overstacking is temporary and they will get to here. However, they cannot sand ride over enemy legions. If this legion now was to move into here as part of their moving two legions, none of these figures can move again, but these two could start their movement and move on as movements considered to be simultaneous. I suggest to make it easier, you would move these ones first and then move those ones. Legions cannot pick up or drop off along the way, but they can split in the region they started. Let's take a deeper look at settlements. Settlements are the sieges, or the pine villages, or the special areas within Carthag and Arakeen. They'll always have a numeric strength, such as this two here. Ecological stations, however, can be simply moved into. They do not need to be attacked. So it's only the ones with numbers that you need to attack. If this legion was to move into here, you'd simply remove the ecological station and the Atreides player would receive one of those markers on the prescience track. 
Enemies cannot move into settlements. It must be an attack because there's a token here with a numeric value on there. They can still attack an undefended settlement and there will be no die roll. Let's go back to the Harkonnen play now and we'll do an attack. In this case, we're gonna do a surprise attack. So using this leadership die, move it to an unused spot. Now we can make a surprise attack with a legion with a leader. Remember, you can only do one of these two options or three if there's a named leader card there. Here's how the attack works. The surprise attack is coming from this area here. A special attack is where for the first round of combat, the attacking player is guaranteed to have received one special, in addition to their other die rolls. What we do is we count up the number of dice each player will roll. Given that they've announced an attack in here, the Harkonnen, we now reveal these tokens. If the siege was unrevealed, we would reveal it at this time. The deployment tokens now are taken out and replaced with the actual units. So in this case, two more regular, an elite, and a special elite. These tokens are removed from the game. They never come back into the game. So if you ever run out of units to deploy as the Atreides player, you are out of luck. There are cards that will allow it as well. Each player takes a number of dice equal to the number of units in the Legion. Here we have six units, so they will get six dice. The Atreides player has four units, but they're also in a settlement. So they also roll dice for this number here. So they'll also roll six. Note that when you're attacking, you can discard planning cards to add dice, one die per card. But you can never roll more than six dice in an attack. So this battle's ready to rock and roll. Let's roll the dice. Okay, how does it work? Firstly, before determining casualties, any elite, special elite, sorry, so this guy and this guy, negates one shield from the opposing team. So the Harkonnen player gets rid of one of these shields, the Atreides player gets rid of one of these shields. And that's one per special elite that's there. From this role, you'll see that no specials came up. Specials relate to abilities of leaders, even the basic leaders, so the Nab leader and the Bashar leader. But remember, because of the surprise attack, the Harkonnen player was determined to have already rolled a special. So a special for the Harkonnen player leader is that they get one extra sword. So they've actually rolled five swords and one shield. The Atreides player has rolled two swords and three shields. So in this case, these three shields negate these three swords. So the Atreides player will take two hits and the Harkonnen one. There are three different ways you can take a hit. One is you can just remove a regular unit from the board. The other is to downgrade an elite or special elite for a regular unit, which is what the Harkonnen player will do. It's often better to downgrade because then you get to roll the same number of dice. You can also remove a leader, either a basic one or a named one, to take a hit. Also meaning you continue to roll the same number of dice in a subsequent round. At this point, there are three options for the Harkonnen player. After both players have removed casualties, the battle can continue or end. If the defending legion is in an area with a settlement, to continue the battle, the attacking player must take one automatic hit. So. If Harkonnen wants to keep going, he could downgrade another. So let's say he downgrade this elite to a regular. He can then perform another attack. If they're not in a settlement, the battle can just keep going unless they choose to cease the attack. If they do cease the attack, basically everyone stays where they are and it moves on to the next turn. The other way a battle can end is via a retreat. The retreating legion is moved by the opposing player and cannot contain enemy units or enemy settlements or sandworms. So in this case, if the Atreides player retreats, they can be moved into this mountain area, this desert area, area with a worm sign token, or even an area containing units of theirs. Strategically, this is a good option for the Harkonnen player because they could move this legion into here, but now they've breached the six unit stacking limit. So they would have to eliminate one, as chosen by the Atreides player. 
This is considered a successful attack by the Harkonnen player. So like a normal attack in which all the units were wiped out, all the units of the attacking successful force must move into that area and leaders. So the entire legion moves in. Because the Harkonnen have won this battle, they'll achieve two points on the supremacy track based on this number here. This siege settlement is now destroyed. This area will never be considered a siege in the future. As part of removing casualties, instead of losing a unit and reducing their number of dice, players can remove a named leader or a regular leader, but named leaders will go to the regeneration tank on their player board. Here, regular leaders return to the supply. In this attack example, Paul and Stilgar want to try and wipe out this legion here. But they'll only roll three dice because that's the number of units they have. Let's assume they roll one special, one shield, and one hit. In this case, the units have hit one of them, immediately killing one, depending on their defense rolls, of course. The special needs to be applied to one of these two. We could apply it to Stilgar for two hits or Paul for one. It doesn't represent both. You can only ever apply one special to one named character. Again, if they'd rolled three specials, only two of these would be used. The other would be wasted. Let's have a look now at how attacks happen via sand riding or troop transport. The Atreides player here wants to attack this legion over here. They can do so by sand riding over the worm sign tokens or sandworms to get there. Again, you would roll all your dice, apply casualties, then move in if this legion was destroyed. Sand riding can never occur through enemy legions, but can go through harvesters. This legion can also move, ending their movement on a sandworm token, but never on a sandworm. Similarly, the Harkonnen group now can attack this unit using this ornithopter. It allows them to move two spaces as long as the ornithopter is in the same starting sector as the Harkonnen. This one shares both these sectors, so that's okay. You just remove the ornithopter from the board and then the attack can proceed. Again, roll all the dice, assign casualties and determine whether they move in if the attack is successful. Each time an action die is played in the future, this will move along one spot, gradually coming off the board and being available for play again. Also, if future named leaders are placed on the board, it bumps them along. If two named leaders were to be placed on the regeneration track at the same time, it can be done so in any order. Each one bumping them along. The next one will bring Paul back in. Like so. During the action resolution phase, if the Atreides player ever achieves the prerequisites for a card that states action resolution phase, they can claim those points immediately on the prescience track. This card is not replaced. The prescience track is really important for the Atreides player. These markers will move up in an effort to achieve these results. They move via achieving points during the turn or by uncovering ecological stations, which also contain the markers. Other effects may also cause these markers to move up. As they move up, different effects will come into play. On the third spot, a new named leader will enter play. On this spot, another named leader will come into play. On this spot, family atomics will trigger. Let's take a look at those now. When family atomics happen, one of these three overlays will be placed on the board. And only ever one. The hole in the rock can go here. Splintered rock can go here or Rimwall West can go here. The areas are marked by this atomics notation here. In this example, splintered rock has been triggered over here. This area is now considered desert, and this plateau area can be attacked by a sandworm. Again, we haven't got to sandworm attacks yet, but we will shortly. But if this sandworm was here, it could attack this plateau area here. Remember that whenever the Atreides player has fewer dice 
than their opponent, they can take a desert power action. We've already seen placing worm sign tokens. They can also now move two sandworms up to two spaces or attack with a sandworm. Sandworms can move one or two spaces in any desert area, but cannot end their turn with any units or tokens apart from ecological testing stations. So this sandworm here could move one, two, one, two, one, two. It can move through enemy units by burrowing underneath and come out on the other side, or it could end its turn even in this ecological testing station here. To attack with the sandworm, the Atreides player removes its figure and targets an area up to two areas away. If the sandworm attacks at a distance of two, the first area must be desert. The target of the attack can be an enemy legion and or harvester in any desert area, or in the case of a legion, also in any plateau or minor erg area within range, though not in a mountain area. If this worm were to attack this harvester, you'd remove it from the board, and the harvester would also go. This worm attacking this legion would come off the board and roll four dice with swords applying hits. Specials also count, with specials applying two hits in deep desert, one in desert, and no hits in minor erg or plateau areas. The Harkonnen play would then immediately remove any casualties. If an attack by the worm here eliminated all the characters and there was only a harvester remaining, it would also come off the board. Neither Harkonnen nor Atreides legions can ever enter or attack areas containing a sandworm. They can, however, traverse an area containing one using sand riding or troop transport. This sandworm here can attack Hagger Basin because family atomics have already happened at Splintered Rock. The intervening area is desert, so as it's attacking two spaces away, it can roll four dice and attack. Note that specials won't count here because this is still a plateau area. Don't forget to remove the sandworm as part of that attack. Harkonnen legions can also trigger the arrival of a sandworm by moving into an area with a worm sign token. In this case, we flip it and a worm appears. When this happens, the legion must retreat. Again, the opposing player, the Atreides player, will determine where they go. So let's say they move them back here. The harvester will be destroyed. The carryall just here cannot save it because they only work during the desert hazards phase. So this harvester is gone. Note also that if the Atreides player ever places a worm sign token in with a legion, it does not trigger. In the desert hazards phase, first discard all worm sign tokens that are in areas containing Atreides legions or sandworms, shuffling them back into the worm sign pool. Then the Atreides player draws random worm sign tokens and places them face down on the board without looking at them, one in each desert that contains a Harkonnen legion or harvester and that does not already contain a worm sign token or sandworm. Finally, the player flips all worm sign tokens on the board face up and resolves their effects in any order. All sandworms appearing during this phase must be placed on the board. If there are no more sandworm figures available, the Atreides player must take them from anywhere else on the board. So for example, this one, could go here. If more than four sandworms appear on the board during this phase, the Atreides player chooses where they appear and discards the remaining worm sign tokens. After all worm sign tokens have been resolved, they're shuffled back face down into the worm sign pool. Now we roll for Coriolis storms. All plateau, minor, erg and desert areas on the board are subject to the fury of these storms, except for the five central areas encircled by the mountains on the plateau here. Note that if family atomics have occurred, such as splintered rock here, Hagger Basin is now vulnerable to these storms and worm attacks through this area here. So as we look around the board, we can see a number of areas that are vulnerable. The Atreides player will roll two dice for each of those legions in those areas. Each sword will count as a hit, and each special will cause a variable number of hits. For minor erg and plateau, no hits. In desert, one hit. In deep desert, two hits. The Atreides player can perform guerrilla training, which is essentially revealing a deployment token. Once revealed, replace the token with the relevant units. The Hakona player can perform the scouting action. It allows them to reveal 
siege tokens or deployment tokens in any area attached to an ornithopter. Simply remove the ornithopter from the board and they can reveal the siege. This is a great strategic option that helps them determine where they want to send their fighters. We now come to spice harvesting, where the Harkonnen player removes spice harvesters from the board to gain their juicy spice. At the start of spice harvesting for the Harkonnen player, discard all active bands, if any, unless the corresponding marker is at the bottom of the board. So here, this one will stay. This one can go back up to here. Again, if any markers move down during the turn, you have to add one band back. In this example, they've got three hidden up in the corner here. These two are worth two each, and this is worth one. So that will be five spice for the round. These are now removed. We now know that the Harkonnen player has managed to collect five spice. But here, they need at least six spice to keep these in line. Why is that? It's two spice per token to maintain the status quo. Three spice to move one up. And if no spice is applied to a token, it moves down. So we can really only keep two where they are. One will drop down. The decision on which one will drop is based on the strategy you're employing and the cards at the top there. But basically we've only spent four spice, we have one left. Well, if we use this token, we can reserve one spice for a future round. It doesn't have to be the next round, but that's one that's been kept for future use. Let's look at this board in more detail now. As soon as a marker moves down in a round, one of the bands will come into effect. Any marker that's on the bottom track will always have the band in place. Remember, it costs three spice to move one back up. The band lasts until the beginning of the harvesting phase in the next round. So again, if more than one token drop down in a turn, you have to apply one ban. The Harkonnen player may also spend three spice to move the supremacy marker up one space on the supremacy track, provided they have only reached space five at the most. At the end of the round, starting with the Harkonnen player, players may replace named leaders with generic leaders on the board. This is optional. Following that, refresh any used leaders by returning them to the active side and onto the board. For Atreides, this may include the Wildmaker. At the end of the round, the Atreides player can claim any end of round prescience cards, such as either of these two. And they may claim that one as well. Even if they've achieved this one, you can never claim more than two over an entire round. At the end of the round, the Atreides player can choose to discard a card from the game permanently if they don't think it's going to help their ongoing objectives. Otherwise, this card is shuffled back in, and at the start of the next round, three more cards will be displayed. If nobody's won by now, start a new round. Benny Gesserit tokens used during the action resolution phase are discarded. So that's an exhaustive and frankly exhausting rules teach. You can see I've even had to change shirts because it's taken a few days. It may not be point by point by the rule book, but hopefully it gives you and your friends enough flavor and strategy tips to get started with this fantastic game from CMON. That's June War for Arrakis. Also, please don't forget to check out Ninjas Unleashed from Gaia Games. They've helped us put this together. So thanks to them. We'll see you next time. Bye. Oh, you could subscribe there and watch a previous video there.